Welcome to the Cold Case Christianity Broadcast, the only Christian case-making program hosted by a cold case homicide detective. Jay Warner Wallace has been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Court TV, and Dateline. For more information about Jim's work and the case for Christianity, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. Now, here's your host, Jay Warner Wallace. Welcome back to Cold Case Christianity. I'm Jay Warner Wallace. We are in season six of our show at NRB TV and enjoying the opportunity to talk to you about Gen Z. Those are the folks who, uh, from let's say uh, elementary school ages through high school, maybe the first year or two of college, are, are now in the church and we are addressing some of the issues that face young people in the church. And we've been doing that all season long so far, 11 episodes actually on just Gen Z. Now we're gonna take a chance to turn a corner and uh, talk a little bit about Something that is, uh, I've never talked about on our show before. Usually we talk about the evidences for God's existence or the evidences for the reliability of Scripture or for the resurrection of Jesus. What I want to do now is, is uh, talk about verse memorization, as crazy as that might sound. People ask me, do you, what is your routine? What is your daily study? How do you, uh, 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 what kind of Bible studies do you do? A lot of my work is done in terms of research about the evidence for Christianity. And, but I do take time to memorize Scripture. And I pick verses that, uh, with my wife that hopefully will help me think clearly about the theology of Christianity or the evidence for Christianity. And what I've discovered is memorizing these verses has actually helped me to share the truth with others. So what we're going to do in this episode is we're going to talk about how uh, to memorize verses, in particular, particularly uh, Psalm 23, which I, may surprise you. I don't usually think of that as an apologetics verse. But we're going to give you some tips today for memorizing and using Psalm 23 to share the truth with the friends you have and the people in your life. It turns out that um, I do think that, uh, that evangelism in the 21st century is going to be spelled apologetics. In other words, not just what do we think is true, what does the Bible say, but why do we think that that's reliable? Why, can we, can we uh, offer evidence for why we believe that the, what the Bible is telling us is actually true? And, and evidence for God's existence, evidence for, you know, to be able to answer the objections that people make when they uh, listen to us talk about Christianity and we offer certain claims. So what we want to do in this first episode of Verse Memorization, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to start memorizing larger passages of Scripture if you haven't done that yet. And we're going to start here with Psalm 23. Uh, which I, I'm starting with because it's such a familiar psalm. Uh, we know the psalm so well that uh, you'll recognize pieces of it. And you probably have already started to memorize pieces of this psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His namesake. Even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You've prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That psalm has so much rich uh, information in it that I think can help people, especially at a time of turmoil. In 2020, we experienced a coronavirus pandemic, and now uh, there's lots of people who probably have questions about where God might be in the midst of such a virus. Uh, the evil that we are experiencing, why would this happen to our family? Why would it happen to our country? Why would it happen to our world? Well, Psalm 23 has a lot to say about it. So we're gonna start here. Here's Psalm 23. Here's what it looks like in its totality. And not that many verses. This is doable. This is something we could actually memorize. And there are several places where I've broken it here in a way that's probably not broken the same way in your Bible, but you'll see why I did that in a minute. This is the psalm that I'm going to challenge you to memorize. And what I'm going to do in each episode of these verse memorization uh, videos is I'm going to uh, try to give you some some uh, tricks and tips that I'm using to help me memorize one verse after another, if that makes sense. And we're gonna do that together. So let's just start off at the beginning of the verse and I'll try to talk about how to use it when you share it with people. And uh, even more importantly, 
tricks and tips to help you to put this in your memory to keep it forever. So let's let's take a look at the first part of the verse. Now here, here it is on your screen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Now you see here, as I've written it out, I've given you some uh, uh, yellow words, gold words. And the idea here is this is what helps me to memorize this first part of the verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That is something that for the most part you and I are very familiar with. We hear that all the time, right? But here, the first part of the verse is really a happy, it's what God does to restore our soul. He makes us lie down in green pastures. Well, that's, that's a good thing, right? That's, that's a great place to be as a green pasture. He leads me beside quiet waters. Oh, those are easy to, to, to travel across. Those are, that restores my soul. So I've helped myself remember these three lines by simply thinking about the content. And this is of God telling us how He restores our soul. He does it by leading us beside, uh, you know, quiet waters. He does it by by you know, making us lie down in green pastures. This is not hard to memorize because these are the things that are we find pleasant. So the first part, I just think about the content. This is how I memorize a verse. What is the content telling us? Well, the first half of this is really about ways that God restores our soul by leading us to places that we think uh, think of as as positive, as as good. And then we're going to turn a corner on this verse. And it's going to help us describe the, the kind of how to face evil in our world. But what's interesting about the first part of the verse is that it focuses on how God restores us. And this is what's so important, right? We have moments where we take a break from life and we lay down in those green pastures that God has provided for us. So what I want you to do is to remember this verse, at least that it begins with something very memorable, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And the first part of the verse, the first three lines, have to do with how God restores us positively with things we would enjoy, green pastures, quiet water. Sometimes in some versions of this, uh, it says still waters. And by the way, I'm using the NASB. That is my favorite uh, path, uh, um, uh, translation that I would use to memorize things. Sometimes we'll step off of that because maybe we've started in a different version or my wife maybe have memorized it in a different version, so I will do it with her. But, but for the most part, this will be in the NASB, and that's why we're using this translation of quiet waters rather than still waters. Let's take a break. When we come back, I'll show you then how, interestingly, God turns and teaches us something as He moves away from the things we might enjoy, green pastures and quiet waters, toward those things that maybe are a little more of a challenge. And we'll do that right after the break. When I was working full-time as a homicide detective, I was also serving in the local church as a youth pastor. And the first year of kids that we graduated, seniors, uh, by the time they came back and visited us for a Christmas break the next year, so they'd been in school maybe, what, 10 or 12 weeks, they already were telling us that they were no longer Christians. I think we lost all but one of our graduating senior class the first year. I remember thinking, I am the worst youth pastor that's ever worked as a youth pastor. How did all these kids walk away? So we shifted everything. I was a guy who was doing a lot of stuff that was experiential in my youth ministry. I had My training was in the arts before I became a detective. So everything in our youth ministry was very experiential, music and visual stuff and experiences back and forth and interactives none of which apparently had any impact on that first class because they all walked away. So I changed everything and I shifted it all toward making the case for why this is true. We've made that our primary emphasis, learning how to serve in the local community, going on missions trips that tested what we were training them to learn. We took them to Berkeley, UC Berkeley. We took them to places like Salt Lake City. We wanted to have theological discussions with people who believe something different. We wanted to have philosophical discussions with people who believe something different. And there was a young man there with us, about the age of my sons, who was probably one of the quietest, sweetest guys I ever knew in youth ministry. And he was kind of timid. And that first trip we took to Salt Lake City, I don't think he said a thing. I think he stood and watched other students interact on the street doing street evangelism. I think he was really along for the ride. Today he serves in a foreign country. And the reason why I think he is such a committed Christian on the mission field is because he, he got a chance to see it modeled. 
You got a chance to see what a forensic faith looks like, what it looks like to examine your theological views, examine scripture through the eyes of a detective, and what it looks like to develop the skills of making the case. And he just grew in his confidence. And, and this is not his shape. His shape is not somebody who would stand in front of a camera and talk like this. Yet he's willing to do it now because he understands that it's true. And once he became so committed and so convinced that it was true, it changed everything. I don't think he would be where he is today if he still held a rather blind faith that just believes it's true without really knowing with certainty from the evidence. He's where he is today because he holds a forensic faith. Okay, we are memorizing and trying to learn to, uh, how to use Psalm 23 to explain uh, the gospel or to uh, help others overcome their skepticism or doubts about the Christian worldview. And we are starting off with Psalm 23 because it's a pretty memorable short verse. Uh, the entire Psalm we're memorizing here, it's a number of verses that we can memorize in order to uh, help others to see why Christianity is true. Now, we've been talking about how God uses something positive, right? Makes you lie down in green pastures. Sometimes God will do this. He'll stop us in our tracks so that we can um, be restored. And by the way, do you find that there are times when you don't think, I want to stop right now? But there's times when my wife will remind me, I need to stop. We need to, to take a breath. We need to have balance. And restoration often means pausing. But look at the next part of this verse. I'll put it on the screen for you. It says that God, He makes, He guides me rather in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Now that's different, right? It's a kind of a different, um, uh, different than like leading uh, by side quiet waters or or making me lie down in green pastures. Now He's doing something different, and I've highlighted it: paths of righteousness, because I think this does goes a long way to explain the next verse, which says, even though. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear no evil, for you are with me. Now, one of the ways I've memorized this turn in the verse, in the psalm rather, is to remember that it's one thing for God to restore you by giving you a pause in places you enjoy, like green pastures and quiet streams. But if, if He wants to guide you in the path of righteousness, to make you righteous for His name's sake, it turns out that's not connected to laying around in the grass. <laughs> that's connected to walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It turns out something troubling is required to make us righteous. It's like people often say, right? You don't, you don't um, experience a transformation and character building in, in a series of wins. If you have a, a season where you were undefeated, you're, you're, it's harder to develop character in that kind of a season than in a season where you lose every game. Well, now character will rise or fall, but the challenge has been thrown out to you so that you have the opportunity to develop character. And this is one of the passages I often use with people who question the goodness of God in a time of a pandemic or any other point of evil. Because it turns out that if you wanted to develop the attributes that you and I think are so important, like courage and compassion and generosity and patience, well, you don't just willy-nilly get those but the snap of a finger. God would have to present you with a true challenge, a true um, um, uh, hardship. Courage is developed in the face of, of hardship, of danger. A world with no danger that cannot develop courage. A world with no uh, um, struggle cannot develop compassion, no illness, no sickness. Where is compassion? You think compassion just, these are responses. All those val valuable attributes that you think of as, as that God would want for us to have, that even if I'm an atheist, I would say I want people in my world to have these attributes of, of courage and empathy and, and, and compassion for others and patience with others. Well, you don't get those unless you are being challenged those are responses to different kinds of hardships. So it turns out, if God is going to um, guide me in the path of righteousness for His namesake, and I'm going to become a righteous person, it means He's going to have to let me walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Because this, this psalm changes dramatically. The first three lines are about restoring my soul through a green pasture and quiet waters. Now I'm being guided in the paths of righteousness by what? Having to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Let's go back to that verse for a second. This is why 
I remember this because it turns a corner here and the paths of righteousness are achieved by the valley of the shadow of death. Now, this next part says this. It says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, I've highlighted the rod and staff and prepare a table. Sometimes when I'm trying to memorize a verse and I'm, I cannot get it, to stick in my head past a certain point, I start to use these stupid little tricks uh, that will help me to, to focus. So I remember the next line, you prepare a table before me by, by thinking of Rod as a person. I have a friend named Rod, and I always think, oh, Rod and his staff are preparing dinner for me. <laughs> so your Rod and your staff, they come for me, you prepare a table before me. So when I get to a point where I'm like, oh, I can't remember the next verse, no, it's about Rod's staff. Rod and his staff are making dinner for me. Stupid, I know, but it helps me to memorize the, this turn. So your rod and your staff, they come for me. Now, let's just talk about how uh, you've probably heard this uh, preached at different points about how shepherds would use a rod and a staff. Remember, if you want to develop your righteousness, your character, you're going to have to go through the valley of death. And God will be with you, but it might feel like he's either using his rod or his staff on you. The staff, of course, is that um, hooked um, uh, uh, stick that uh, allows the shepherd to guide and to pull back when a sheep is in danger to kind of gently guide. The rod is a little bit different. That's like a little snap, you know, just to get the, the you know, if he's not paying attention or if he's not responding, that's to be a little more aggressive. And there are times when you probably feel like in your life, God is either using the staff or the rod. But this does not mean a, a good shepherd who loves his sheep still has to use both of those things. And so when I see that people are struggling, I, and, I, and it's wonder if God is there, I just remind them that a good father, as it says in Hebrews, is quick to discipline his own kids. And sometimes the guidance, you know, if you say, don't, don't cross the street without me, to your three-year-old, and he takes a step anyway because he's a little bit rebellious, you're going to be a little more aggressive the next time you tell him what to do, right? So this is true of God and all, us, and a lot of times we're just not responding. We're, we're not listening to what God has for us, and God's got to use his rod rather than his staff. This does not mean that he's not there. As a matter of fact, when the child is, is feeling the rod, or, or a sheep is feeling the rod or the staff of the shepherd, then you know that the shepherd is there, and this is what happens often with God. Now, interestingly, he says this next thing, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. If a king was to do that in the biblical times, to prepare a table, to bring you in as his guest, the entire time you're sitting at that table, you have the protection of the king. Even if your enemies were in the room, they would not move on you as long as you're at the table of the king, because that means the king is offering you his, not only his hospitality, but also his protection. And this is really important to keep in mind. This is not just, oh, you're having dinner with me. It's that God is saying that you are sitting at my table. And even though you might have enemies all around you, like the situation may not seem like it's a lot different to you, well, I'm here. And I'm protecting you. You have my protection and my authority covering you. So this verse really tells us that, yeah, in times of where you think you're facing evil, it's not that God is absent. It says he may be using his rod or his staff to, to guide you or to, to, to move you in a certain direction. But remember, you're sitting at God's table. He, he's, got, he's got his arms around you. He's, he's protecting you even in the presence of your enemies. We'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll finish up Psalm 23 to show you what else you can use to share the good news with your friends. Be sure to visit the Cold Case Christianity website daily to read Jim's blog, watch the weekly video, or listen to the Cold Case Christianity podcast. You'll also find great free resources, including the free downloadable monthly Bible insert. While you're there, be sure to sign up for Jim's daily case notes email. Cold Case Christianity is designed to help you become a better Christian case maker. Be sure to download the free Cold Case Christianity app from the iTunes Store and the Android Marketplace. The Cold Case Christianity app puts all the resources from coldcasechristianity.com in the palm of your hand. You can read the daily blog, listen to podcasts, and watch videos from within the application. And Jim uses the app to send direct messages to fans of Cold Case Christianity. 
The app will also link you to all the Cold Case Christianity social media and provide you with a direct connection to J. Warner Wallace. Download the app today and become a better Christian case maker. In addition to Jim's daily blog and weekly podcasts and videos, Jim continues to write books designed to help you become a better Christian case maker. At coldcasechristianity.com, you'll find a link to Cold Case Christianity, God's Crime Scene, Forensic Faith, and Alive. These resources will help you defend what you believe and share it with others. And if you want to help your kids become Christian case makers, be sure to check out the kids' versions of Jay Warner's books. Okay, so let's finish up Psalm 23. Uh, the next part of the verse is, now remember, we've already talked about how he, he prepared this table. God has prepared this table in which you are sitting under the king's protection at the king's table, even though your enemies may be all around you, even though you're walking right now through the valley of the shadow of death, surrounded by enemies, you're at the king's table. Look what the next verse says. It says, you have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. I like this translation in the NASB because it doesn't say you anoint my head with oil. It says you have. It's already done. You've, it's, your, your head has already been anointed with oil. What does that even mean, to be anointed with oil? Translate for your friends who don't understand this. Anointed with oil is a, a way, number one, of demarking a special position that you have. This was not unusual for prophets and kings in biblical times. Even in, Rome, uh, even in Roman times, even in English history, kings would be anointed at, their, at the, uh, the crowning of the king. They would be anointed with oil as a symbol of their, their status, as a symbol of their uh, special status before the entire culture, their special status before God. Uh, that's happened to us. Jesus' head was anointed. He's saying here in this verse that, that I'm actually going to anoint... This has two meanings. A shepherd in, in, in ancient times would often anoint sheep with oil to protect them from insects and parasites and rashes and all kinds of things. So this is not just a matter of saying you're special and you're mine, but that I'm going to protect you and care for you. And although it may not seem like I'm doing that, uh, your cup overflows. You, 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 your cup is overflowing and you don't even know it because it turns out this whole time you've been sitting at the king's table. Now, I, I get it. There, it won't feel like in this life sometimes like I'm sitting at the king's table. If that's true, why is this happening to me? The last verses of the Psalm 23 will explain it to you. And here they are on the screen. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I remember this because all of the days of my life connected forever. Also, this is a great closing to a psalm. It's such a famous closing that I just enjoyed memorizing it because I love to be able to say it because it's just something I've heard in church for a while, and I just love the way it it rolls off the, the, the lips. It's, it's, very, it's a very kind of a poetic way to close the psalm. But it has such rich meaning. Now, when you feel as though God is not really there because you're not seeing anything in your life change, remember that all the days of your life, as described by the psalmist here, th this is not just all the days of your mortal life because you're going to be living with God forever, according to this verse. So all the days of your life have to include the days, so to speak, that you'll be living with God after you die, forever in the house of God where you will dwell with God. And what that does is it extends our expectation for mercy and justice, and when is this pain going to stop, and when am I going to see my family, and when is this, all this evil going to end? Well, remember, God's timeline does not just include your 90 years, or whoever's 90 years preceded you, or whatever, whoever's 90 years or some character or some person from biblical times. God is working with eternity. And that changes everything. Eternity changes the problem of evil because under God's economy, it's not that He hasn't acted to stop evil. It's just that you may not see it yet. But it will happen because God is not working with your limited 90 years. And this verse helps you to see that. God is actually working with eternity because you'll be dwelling in the house of God forever. So when you look at the verse, let's put it up again. Yeah, goodness, it turns out God is leading you, leading you in the paths of righteousness, guiding you in the paths of righteousness. And His goodness and loving kindness is following you. 
But if you think all the days of my life is limited to the 90 years you'll spend on planet Earth, maybe 100 if you're lucky, right? Whatever it is, okay, 70, whatever it is, you're, you're counting God short because God has forever to work with, eternity. When you're a million years into eternity, whatever you've suffered in these 90 years on planet Earth will feel like a millisecond compared to eternity. You have gotta grasp that. Eternity changes everything. So this verse is a great verse, this psalm is a great psalm to use when talking to people who are struggling with the problem of evil because it helps me to explain to them, and I try to say it and inflect it in a way that will help them to see uh, the, the impact that God has on your life if you won't limit Him to just your temporal life. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Look, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He, he leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His namesake, even though I walk in the that valley of the shadow of death. I fear no evil because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want us to be able to, to explain that and to speak that to our friends in such a way that they get it, that even though you're walking in the valley of shadow of death right now, you are not alone. You're still sitting at the king's table because the king's table is an eternal table. He is not concerned with your temporary comfort. comfort. He is concerned with your eternal character. And the only way to develop that character, to be guided in the paths of righteousness, is for us to have to walk through a valley of death. So, as it's happening, have confidence that it's not an evidence against God's existence. Evil is an evidence for God's existence because without the standard of righteousness that God sets, evil is simply a matter of opinion. If there is an objective evil, something that's truly evil, it would require a true objective standard of righteousness by which we would measure it. Without God, there's no true evil. There's just opinions about evil. But if there is a God who's objectively the standard of evil, it turns out that, 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 that we can call something truly evil because we're pointing to the same objective standard. And when God allows you to go through it, it's not because He's absent. It's because like the shepherd, He's walking with you and He's looking at the economy of not 90 years, but of eternity. God is more concerned with your eternity than He is with your here and now. Hope that helps you as you think about how to memorize verses and how to use your verse memorizations to help your friends and family members. When we come back uh, next week, we'll do another uh, verse that I hope will be even more challenging as we learn how to use these verses to share the gospel. I'll see you next time right here at Cold Case Christianity. Thanks for joining us at the Cold Case Christianity broadcast. If you're interested in more information about this week's topic, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For a thorough investigation of the reliability of the New Testament Gospels and the case for Christianity, be sure to purchase Cold Case Christianity, God's Crime Scene, Forensic Faith, and Alive.